Curious Lloyd. The Godfather, Goodfellas, and Casino. You've seen all the movies. You know all the characters. You love how they talk. You laugh at their comebacks. Whenever anyone says, hey, you're funny, you instinctively reply, funny how? Am I a clown? Am I here to amuse you? You're intrigued by the drama, the action, the blood, and the humor. Italian mob movies undoubtedly have a certain allure, but how much of it is real? Do they accurately portray the organized crime syndicate? How and when did all the craziness begin? To answer those questions and more, I shall explain the true factual history of the Italian organized crime and how it came to be the true story. Let's begin with the word itself. Although the exact origin of the word mafia is uncertain, some believe it originated in 1282 during the French invasion of Sicily and the saying, Mortia alia Francia Italia anila, which means death to the French is Italy's cry, or mafia. Then eventually the word mafia came to mean manly in Sicily. Another theory of the origin of the word mafia begins as early as the 9th century. During that period, Sicily was ruled by Arab forces. The original inhabitants were oppressed and desperately tried to escape and find refuge. In Arabic, the word mafia means refuge. Sicily was invaded by the Normans in the 11th century, and its people were forced into labor and oppression once again. Every invasion of Sicily thereafter, French invasion in the 12th century, Spanish in the 13th, and Germans and Austrians and the Greeks resulted in native tribes seeking refuge in the hills of the island. The refugees eventually developed a secret society of unification intended to create a sense of family based on the Sicilian heritage. The structure of the organization was built on the idea of family and had a strong hierarchical makeup. The Dons were the family heads in charge of the Mafia in every village. They had to report to the Dons of Dons who lived in Palmero, the capital of Sicily. Members of the unified organization were required to take an initiation oath. The oath included five basic principles upon which the Mafia was and still is based. A code of silence, never to rat out any Mafia member, never to divulge any Mafia secrets, even if they were threatened by torture or death. Complete obedience to the boss, obey the boss's orders no matter what. Assistance, to provide any necessary assistance to any other respected or befriended Mafia faction. Vengeance. Any attacks on family members must be avenged. An attack on one is an attack on all. Avoid contact with authorities. The Mafia grew large and strong by the 19th century. By then, it had become a vast criminal orientated society. They followed their own authority and their rules and ignored any other form of order. Joining the Mafia was like joining a religion. It was a commitment for life. You could not retire from it, and this still holds true to this day. This was a serious religion, even for the young Mafia members. They were taught basic uses of sword, knife and rope in order to be able to murder their victims. It would be a very violent death to anyone who became an informant. The American branch of the Mafia, named La Costa Nostra, is believed to have begun in 1893, when Don Vito Cassiofero fled to New York after the murder of the banker Emilio Norta Bartolo in Sicily. More mafioso fled to America during the 1920s when Mussolini attempted to experiment the Mafia in Sicily. The Mafia saw lucrative opportunities in the United States. Thousands of gunmen and thieves came over. They were joined by thousands of Italians and Sicilians who were looking for a better life in America. By the early 1900s, every large city in the United States had its own Mafia sanction. They concentrated on protecting rackets. Soon, they expanded by racketeering in other areas, such as gambling, prostitution and bootlegging. The Prohibition era in the 20s is probably the most legendary era in gangster history. Mafia members basically declared their power and wealth openly. The mob flourished. This began Al Capone's reign, as portrayed in the movie Untouchables. Alfonso Capone, also known as Scarface, was a gangster in Chicago who amused a fortune by selling alcohol and women. He also controlled every possible aspect of crime. Capone was sent to Alcatraz in 1931, not for various killings and breaking the 18th Amendment, but for income tax evasion. When Capone was sent away, Chicago's gangster image began to fade. New York became the next big mafia city, the city for the next generation of gangsters. Once prohibition ended, gangsters recognized themselves in syndicates, or organizations which control gambling and prostitution, the distribution of drugs and new forms of business. After Capone's time, a new gangster surfaced, Salvatore Lucania, better known as Charlie Lucky Luciano, or Boss of the Bosses. Unlike Capone, who was only associated with Italians and Sicilians, 
Lucky Luciano was ethically liberal. He began to recruit Jews in his organization, similar to the movie Casino. Luciano was close to his partners, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel and Maya and Langsy. Bugsy Siegel built a super casino in Las Vegas, but was murdered before it became profitable. Within 10 years of his death, Las Vegas became the major powerhouse of gangster dealings, investments and skimmings. Luciano's gangs were always in conflict with the pure Sicilians, gangs of Giuseppe Massaria, who was also known as Joe the Boss, the first boss of what is known now as the Genovese family, and Salvatore Mananzaro, head of now the Bonanno family, from the other side of New York. Luciano finally defeated Massaria after many mafia wars, known as the Castella Mars Wars. Luciano took over Massaria's organization and became a powerful boss. Before Massaria died, he took a man named Carlo Gambino into his group. When Massaria was killed, Gambino shifted power under Salvatore Mananzaro. However, it was a short stay for him. After Mananzaro died, Joe Bonanno succeeded him, and Carlo Gambino decided to join a new commission called the Young Turks. Gambino alongside with his brother-in-law, Peter and Paul Castellano, became united with. When Mangano mysteriously disappeared, Gambino pushed for an alliance with Charlie Luciano and his associate, Frank Castello. After Managano's disappearance, Albert Anastasia became the boss and appointed Carlo Gambino as boss. But no one took this seriously. Gambino was at the time considered weak, taking put-downs and ridicule from Anastasia. No other Mafia member would have taken this abuse. Nobody thought of Gambino as a threat at the time, which made it very easy for him to do unexpected things. In 1957, a man named Vito Genovese approached Gambino after getting rid of Anastasia. This would give Gambino top spot. Fed up with Anastasia, Gambino did away with him. However, he could not stop there. Genovese's power was hungry. He wanted to rule all the families. He became ruthless and over Zeusless. Gambino knew he had to put a stop to him before he got totally out of hand. Together with his new allies, Luciano and Costello, Gambino set up Genovese in a narcotic scheme that landed him in prison, sentenced to 15 years. Gambino continued to avoid the FBI and the CIA. Every time they tried to deport him or put him on trial, he would have a heart attack or somehow end up in hospital. It was an ingenious plan. On the other side of New York, the Bonanno family didn't have much luck avoiding authorities. Bonanno member Philip Rusty Rustelli succeeded Carmine Galanto as boss. Two of Rustelli's top men were Dominic Sonny Black Napoltiano and Benjamin Lefty Guns Ruggerio. They were portrayed in the movie Donny Brasco, which was based on the true story of an undercover FBI agent, Joe Pistone. Crimes committed by Sonny Black and Lefty Guns were exposed. Sonny Black disappeared and Lefty went to prison. During the early 1970s, Joseph Colombo, head of the Prophecy family, began bringing unwanted national attention to the mob and those associated with it. By starting the Italian-American Civil Rights League, Carlo Gambino confronted and asked him to stop the rallies because of the media attention it was developing. Colombo refused. As the story goes, Colombo actually spat in Gambino's face. This infuriated Gambino. He approached the Gallo brothers, Joe and Larry, to do away with Colombo. He wanted to kill them at a national covered American Civil Rights League rally in order to express what will happen if you cross Gambino and to ironically exhibit the association of violence and the Italian American heritage, the very heritage that Colombo was supporting through rallies. It was vengeance and punishment for disrespecting a Don. At the end of his life, Gambino appointed poor Castellano as the new head of the family. Castellano was greedy and disliked. Castellano walked around more like a banker than a mobster. Gambino thought it was a good idea to move the family into legitimate business, away from the streets. In 1985, Castellano was killed by another young Turk, John Gotti. Gotti was as loud and media exposed as anyone the Mafia had ever seen since Alba Anastasia. John Gotti was known as the Teflon Don for his three separate trial acquittals in the late 1980s. Finally, in 1991, the FBI indicated Gotti his underboss, Sammy the Bull Granavo, and Frankie Lucasio on racketeering and murdering conspiracy charges. Granavo shocked everyone when he broke the emerita and testified against Gotti. Granavo was placed into witness protection and served less than five years. John Gotti is serving a life sentence in a federal prison in Illinois. His son John Gotti Jr. is currently acting as a boss for the Gambino crime family. However, a RICO case has been developed against him. So there you have it, the true story of the Italian Mafia. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and I will catch you again next week. Gambino pushed for an alliance, a peace agreement, with Charlie Luciano and his associate Frank Costello. Yeah, I'm a fucking monger, I can't even fucking say this properly.